Welcome back. I'm Gary Parr. You're listening to Fiber Talk, the twice weekly podcast for people who do fine art with needle and thread. And this week, my guest from Heart in Hand Needle Art, Cecilia Turner. Hi, Cecilia. Hi, Gary. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Glad to have you. Yeah, we uh, we had a nice chat there in Nashville and uh, been wanting to we get did. to this so we could talk. Yes. As we look at what you do, and, and you know, there's so many people who do small designs. Mm-hmm. What What is that in your estimation? What is that about small designs that one makes them so popular and that so many designers do them? Is it because people can finish them quickly? What is it about that? Well, I, I think part of it is human nature that we are fulfilled by completing projects. And if we have small projects, we can complete more. So we are more fulfilled by completing you know, more. It's interesting when years ago, and it was like 1995, when I first launched the first We Ones, um, which we've done dozens of since then, hundreds probably since then. um, I think that was born out of conversations that I had with a couple of people in the industry, one of whom was my dear friend, Ruth Sparrow from Twisted Threads. Her shop was uh, here in town, and she and I would get together, oh, once a month and have a have dinner and just brainstorm and, and talk about the industry and what we were doing and just get ideas from each other. It was a great time. And we talked about, and she, owned, of course, owned this cross-stitch store, but she also was designing. And so we kind of came into the industry at the same time. And so we talked about what was selling in her shop and what people were interested in. And at that time in the in the mid '90s, um, more and more women were, were a lot of women were still working and they didn't have a lot of time and they had kids and so they just wanted little things that they could finish. Um, so smaller projects were becoming more popular at that point. And so it was conversations with her about doing small designs and then also conversations I had with uh, Michael Holiday, who was the uh, owner of Eastside Moldings at that uh, point in time and a frame company. And he and I talked about developing a series of products that would fit these designs, a six by six frame where you had a lot of designs that were the same size and people could pop them in and out of that frame or out of um, a mirror or a, a tray or whatever. So they didn't have to buy a frame every time they stitch something, especially if it was seasonal. Mm -hmm. So if it was a Christmas design, they could pop it in and out of a black frame. And then when it came time for Easter, they could put an Easter design in there. But if they were all basically the same size, it gave them the versatility to pop things in and out of a frame or some kind of a wooden finishing option. And that kind of kept the cost down for stitchers. They could stitch a lot of projects, but not always have to finish them and, and pay for that additional finish finishing. So I think some of those conversations with other people in the industry just sparked um, something we thought we'd try and, and it grew and continues, you know, 25 years later. So, <laughs> yeah, that's the thing is 25 years of, of doing this is, um, is impressive in its own right. Well, it, you know, it's interesting. It's, I heard somebody talking the other day about um, being diligent and being, um, I can't remember the word she used, but just talking about as a creative, continuing to keep over a long period of time that create creativity alive. And it's, you know, it's something I think about and see in different people in the industry that over a period of 25 years, pe- some of the same people are still in it. And people kind of sometimes have to take a bit of a break from certain aspects of it just because of family issues or health issues, or they just kind of get burned out a little bit and they step back a little bit and then they get replenished and they come back. And it's kind of interesting to see that as a creative, it's difficult to keep that longevity yeah. at a high, at a high level for that long a period of time, because we work, so hard and many of us are, you know, one woman or one man shows that, uh, it, you know, it's it's a lot. Yeah. And and that's, yeah, that's the other part is over 25 years, the ebbs and flows of family life and personal life. Yeah. That, that, uh, to keep going 
Um, and maybe, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe it's, it's your release. Maybe it's your out that, uh, mm. uh, gives you the escape. I don't know. Is that, does it play uh, that role for you? It, it definitely does. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I got into it so heavily was that it was, um, it's my therapy, you know, it keeps me sane <laughs> as, you know, as you say, the ebb and flow of life and, you know, the ups and downs and, th you know, things that that happen in our lifetime. So, and I think it is for a lot of women, a lot of people that stitch, um, there's just something therapeutic about putting needle to thread that that's really soothing to us. And is something we can look forward to just calming ourselves with. Yeah. It has that, that role. And, you know, that comes up time and time again, that role of therapy and, and escape. And, and uh, it's, it's really one of, one of the great aspects of this hobby is there's no drugs involved, you know, there's no, no doctors, there, you know, there's none of that. It's just give me a chair and a needle and thread and a piece of cloth mm -hmm. and, and just let me just escape for a while. And right. It's, right. Uh, yeah, it's, it's just one of the neat things about the hobby. You bet. You bet. For, for male and female, too. I mean, I, ha I have the Absolutely. same, you know, I, I get the same benefit the out same of The same buzz, it. Yeah. Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah, without a doubt. And yeah. Um, it's just, you know, you feel kind of in the evening, you want, you just feel that tug. I want to go, go do a little bit of that stitching just to, because it, it gives you that feeling. You just relax and, and your mind has to pay attention to something other than the day's activities. And yeah, it's, it's wonderful. Right. <laughs> it really is. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that, the, so that you, that, all right, that helps me understand the, the small, designs and in your foundation there and and it makes mm -hmm. sense i mean we it, it really does because I, I tend toward bigger ones and mm -hmm. bigger ones i have a, whole, have a whole bunch of them and they aren't completed <laughs> <laughs> but you know it, i really am a process stitcher i just enjoyed the the process more than uh -huh. than you know i got to get to the end the and get it finished it. yeah yeah, and, yeah. Um, and and the, the the small ones, especially you guys that do small ones in, in the series, you mm -hmm. must uh, get a lot of collectors. Where I've got to have the whole oh, yeah. series. Oh yeah, yeah, it, it's very true. And I I've had a number of short term series, like I'll do a monthly series, or I'll do something for each one of the seasons. But then I've also um, done over the years. I'm trying to remember, I think the first year I did one of these was 1999. I did a collector's heart. And it's a kit that I do, and I release it in, like, January. And it's always got a heart on it, some kind of heart. And usually um, usually a quotation or a couple of words or something that goes along with it. Um, a lot of them have been used as anniversary gifts or wedding gifts or engagement commemorations. But a lot of them are just Valentine-related uh, or somebody might give them to, you know, somebody that they care about or, around Valentine's Day. But I started doing those in 1999, and many of them are sold out um, and not available anymore. But in, let's see, so it would have been a couple of years ago when I did the 20th anniversary, I for the first time did two designs in the kit, and it exploded like I, it was an unexpected blessing to me. I wasn't expecting the, the sales that it did, but I, I think it was because it was commemorative. Everybody was like, oh, well, that's the 20th anniversary. I've got to get that one, too, you know. <laughs> yeah. So it's funny how, how sometimes those series um, take off in ways, you know, that are unexpected and uh, continue. In, into yeah. that, that's, really, that's really an unpredictable, yeah, literally an unpredictable part. You start a series. Oh, yeah. And I'm sure you have some that, uh, that have effectively flopped. And others Absolutely. that have just taken right <laughs> off, yeah, 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 and it's and it's hard to know which ones. I, sometimes I can guess that something might be a little more nichey than others, and so I might not print as many. But there's always one that, for whatever reason, takes off, and and I can not put my finger on what it is, um, <laughs> and and it just goes and goes and goes, and you reprint and reprint and reprint and and. It's great, but figuring out what it is about that, like I do a, a Santa every year, I do a wee Santa, and last year's in particular took off like crazy, 
and I still couldn't tell you why. I guess people think he's cute. I don't know and why they didn't think three years ago or four years ago or whichever <laughs> one was as cute as he is. I don't know. but Because um, you did. <laughs> <laughs> right. But, uh, but it's just funny how some of them touch a, you know, just – appeal to people more than others and they take off and it, it's wonderful. I'm, I'm glad that people are, you know, enjoy the work. Oh so. yeah. That's gotta be a great feeling when you have to keep reprinting something cause it just keeps selling out. And, sure. uh, but I, yeah. you know, I wish I thought it was going to sell that many in the beginning and then I would have <laughs> reprinted and then I wouldn't have to go back to the printer so many times, but it's fine. Mm. It's great. Love yeah. Own. Yeah. That, that savings at the printer, if you can print, <laughs> Print 5,000 instead of 1,000, yes. That, that's right, absolutely. It's a big difference, you bet it is, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then, uh, yeah, and then I can imagine, what is it about this one? Because if, if I can figure that out, I yeah, do more right. of that. I do more of that, yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah, there's always time to figure that out. And and sometimes you can figure that out. If you do a, a series that takes off, then you can, um, you know, continue to do it. Or sometimes you do a single design and people go, so are you going to do more of those? And it's like, oh, well, I guess I could. I hadn't thought about it, you know. And so, <laughs> you know, people give you ideas about that, too, if there's something that, that particularly appeals to them or shop owners who um, are selling well on something. And, and they see the future of that design evolving into something else that you, you know, hadn't put your hand on. So, yeah, yeah, yeah I've, I've wondered about that, too. What what determines a series? Because like your like your new square dance. I mean, that's mm -hmm. obviously a series because it's every month. You know, that's right. That's a given. But right. yeah, what what determines if it's a series or not? Do you start out and say, well, I have this idea and then I can extend off of that eight other times with eight other variations. So that makes a series or, or yeah, then, you know, are you going to do more of this one thing? And uh, well, right. I, right. Let, me, let me see. <laughs> let me see. Yes. Yeah. Sometimes it, it's in your brain. Okay. I'm going to do a monthly series this year, you know, and it evolves in that way. And then sometimes you know, you do something and it kind of takes off and you go, okay, how can I reinvent this? You know, because it, isn't that what a lot of marketing is about is you invent something and then you continue to use it. Look at Beanie Babies, you know, they right. did one and then, you know, it continued for years. But if you can, you know, figure out how not to have to reinvent the wheel every time you do a new design, you know, you're, you're ahead of the game. If you can use that same uh, idea and expound on it, then, you know, you land on a series that you didn't really expect. But. Yeah. Yeah. Do you get uh, collectors? I mean, is, is it a collector? Is it collecting as a factor in this, uh, in these series? Oh, I, I think so. Yeah. yeah, I think so. I think people sometimes when you do like this monthly series I'm doing, and I've done several of them over time that are, you know, one for every month of the, of the year, um, they always sell well, and I don't know, and and it's not necessarily every one of the 12 that appeals to people, but if there are a handful of them within that that appeal, then they kind of pick them all up, or they pick up the ones they want that appeal to them, and then maybe later go back and go, oh, I may as well just get them all, <laughs> you know, because I might, I might decide I want to do that, or... You know, Mary's birthday's in February. It's not my favorite, but I could do that for Mary, you know, right, right. So that kind of thing. But, um, but oh, yeah, it's definitely, definitely tends to be collectors. Although there's, you know, you can do a series of 12 and there's three of them that sell much better than the, you know, the whole Oh, that series. happens then. That okay. Happens. Oh. Oh, sure. Oh. It's, yeah, it's not always even because you'll, I, I like I did a, a series called Joyful Journal. And there's one for every month. And the sand on there um, is very strong. And he reminds everybody of Frank Bilek, who is the designer for Mosey and Me, who was on Trading Spaces years ago. Yes, I, I and remember him. Sees, yes. yeah. Everybody sees that Santa and goes, oh, my gosh, it looks just like Frank Bilek. And I, I think it does. I didn't design him to look like Frank, but, um, but it does kind of look like Frank. And But I have sold – more of that one than a lot of the others in that series. I don't think it's because it looks like Frank, although it could love you, Frank, <laughs> but, um, but it, so that happens. And I think, you know, that's a Christmas design and so many people like to stitch Santas and Christmas designs it, yeah. over, you know, something that might be in July or something, you know, whatever the motif was in July. So, 
Yeah, I'm always impressed with those people who have their Christmas tree and then they have the uh, uh, stitched ornament tree and, mm-hmm. and, and just packed with ornaments. Uh, oh, yeah, oh, and several it? of them. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, you yeah. see, yeah, every now and then you'll see somebody has two or three or four trees just full yeah. of ornaments, yeah. Yeah, it's and, impressive, isn't it? Oh, it is. And Well, and what, what, stitched, fun. Yeah. what fun, what yeah. fun to haul all that out at Christmas, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. oh, man, it's, it is impressive. Like, wow. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, it's interesting when, when I, one of the things that led me into uh, doing Heart and Hand was stitching Christmas ornaments. Years ago, um, in 1985, my uh, husband and I, our first son died at birth. And he died in September. And that fall, when I was on leave from work, I stitched more Christmas ornaments in that period of time because it was my therapy to help in my grief over losing my son. And it, and that kind of launched me into being way more of a prolific stitcher than I had been at that point, Mm -hmm. which led me, I, I really believe that in many ways it led me to doing heart and hand because I was way more of a prolific stitcher. It just, it really spoke to me and it really fed what I needed at the time. And I continued to do that. And then as time went on and I couldn't, like I couldn't find a design that I wanted for, if I wanted some watermelons, watermelons were big back in the late eighties to hang, you know, little stitched watermelons to hang in my kitchen. And I couldn't find a design. I would figure it out myself and design it. And then I would stitch it and hang it. And so I started doing some of those, um, some of that, some of my own designing in that way. And then landed, uh, saw some cross stitch magazines, entered a couple of contests that, um, they sponsored and finally won a, $100. $100. I won $100 designing a heart for Classic Cross Stitch Magazine back in, I think it was 91. And I thought, hmm, maybe I could do this, you know. <laughs> and so I, I just kept kind of doing those kind of things. And in 19, it was like, I don't know. I don't know when it was. It was in the 80s sometimes. I went to, there used to be a, a consumer show in um, Illinois at Rockham Gardens. Uh years ago. And I went to this consumer show and I was just there, you know, to buy cross stitch. And because I was interested and just kind of tiptoeing into asking some people what it was like to, you know, to design more. Mm -hmm. And I met a gal, um, Phyllis Baldwin, who um, worked with Diane Grabner, who was an artist of Amish designs. And Phyllis was just so um, open and encouraging um, with her, with the information that she gave me about being in the industry. And I showed her a couple of, I think I probably had a, you know, a magazine or two with me and showed her what I had done. And she was very encouraging um, about my work and suggested that I, you know, try and do more submissions and that I, you know, try and get my work, um, published Mm -hmm. and it, it, it meant a lot to me and, and it really kind of lit a spark, um, for me to continue looking into it. And, um, my very supportive husband, uh, allowed us to go on vacation, um, near Charlotte, North Carolina. So I could go to the, the net, the needlework market there (laughs) one summer and, I walked the market and just introduced myself to people. And my husband literally met women who were shop owners in the hot tub at the hotel. True story. (laughs) And they said, well, honey, she needs to meet Lane Hoffman. And I didn't know who Lane Hoffman was at Hoffman Distributing. And so the next day I went up and introduced myself to Lane. Had no clue I was introducing myself to, you know, the biggest distributor in the country. Right. And said to him, what do you think? (laughs) (laughs) And, and he, you know, looked at my stuff and was interested and picked me up. And, you know, a year later I was, uh, he was distributing my designs and I was exhibiting it at Charlotte market. But I, I'm the kind of person that has to 
check those things out before going, you know, I can't yeah, just yeah. go. Right. So I was glad that I had been there before I exhibited there. It made the process easier for me. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's so great. Yeah. Pe people like that, it, you know, you hear in, and it doesn't matter what the, what the industry or what the hobby uh, people mm -hmm. who are, are protective, always guarding their turf, you know, mm. won't, won't share with anyone. And right. then, and then you run into people like that who, will you just be open and help you and yeah. that's so wonderful when that happens because it yeah. really it gives people a chance to to get themselves going and have some good advice and uh uh you know the, there's I, I often think there are more of those people than the than the turf mm -hmm. garters <laughs> uh, yeah i have found ours to be a very supportive industry for the you know for the in large part and it many people have encouraged me along the way and and I hope that uh, I have done that for others and will continue to do that for others I think that the internet now allows us to have more of a conversation community with yes. people who are interested um, and allows us to be more encouraging to to people who are who are trying to break into the industry and I you know I think it's great I, but I I think we're lucky to be in an industry where people are so supportive and encouraging it. it it's great. Yeah. I had an example here just in the past couple of weeks. Oh yeah. Where, um, uh, I, several Facebook groups, needlework, Facebook groups, mm -hmm. and of course, uh, uh Instagram and, and, and everything. And I join, I, I do a lot of cycling. So I joined a Facebook group for cyclists over who are older than 50 years old. Uh huh. And because, uh, you know, I relate to that, um, <laughs> but I it was it was such a stark contrast because you, you had and it's a it's a huge group of people, uh, global uh, people who cyclists all over the world. Mm -hmm. And I was you know, I'd read some some uh, posts and some replies and people just sniping at each other and arguing. No kidding. And and it it, it shocked me. Because hmm. it's been so long since I've been in touch with anything like that. Because uh, virtually everything I, I read these days is needlework. And there's mm -hmm. there's none of that in, you know, at least I haven't, in the groups I'm in, there, there right. just is essentially none of that. And if, right. it does, if it does show up, it gets shut down quickly. And uh, it makes it such a pleasant uh, place to be. If, you know, if you're not stitching to, to be online and, and, and reading what people have and people encouraging each other and, and uh, constructive criticism and help. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and I, I was just shocked back to reality with the cycling group because, oh, geez, this garbage again, you know. And, yeah. and, uh, and, and immediately I, I stayed in the group, but immediately I went to more of a skim mode where mm -hmm. I see posts and I start seeing uh, – arguing or you know well do it this way you're an idiot for not doing it this way and mm. and, and yeah, I, it yeah. makes you less interested oh. in entering in right to and, the conversation and, uh, yeah. yeah and i don't see any of that in the needlework and it, it really is so great and so refreshing and mm -hmm. it, it makes the online experience positive and it's uh yeah i i mean it, i i just think it's great it and it it just is at really at the core of the industry of the of the hobby mm-hmm so yeah, it was it was just a weird, <laughs> weird yeah. experience. Yuck. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you started, you learned from your grandmother and mm -hmm. and stamped cross stitch. Well, yeah, back in the day, I, I never I never <laughs> did stamped cross stitch. Well, I didn't do much of it either, but that was how, you know. I mean, this is you know elementary school age. My grandmother would come to visit my grandmother lived in Illinois and we lived in Ohio and she would come to visit once or twice a year and she always brought her stitching with her and so that was my first introduction to cross stitch and it was just it was stamped cross stitch she would make like quilts uh -huh. um that were you know stamped cross stitch yeah <laughs> yeah that was the thing that was the thing. absolutely it wasn't yeah. counted thread work then or at least that wasn't what she was doing or what you know, that was probably back in the, oh, the mid-70s, early 70s. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it was stamped. 
wonder when it became cro- counted. Wonder if Boy, that... I don't know, Gary. I don't know when that that transition happened. It certainly. I mean, I didn't. I didn't start stitching as an elementary school kid and keep stitching for the rest of my life. You know, I when I was in junior high, high school, college, I didn't stitch at all. Um, I was, you know, busy with other activities and stuff like that. So normal, normal teenager (laughs) activities. Right, right. Um, So I came back to it after I would say after college, probably, or, you know, after shortly after I got married, I guess, in in the early 80s then. So somewhere between, you know, 70s and the 70s and the 80s, I guess it evolved into to more counted thread work. I'm sure yeah. there's people in the industry that know the answer to that question, Gary, and I feel confident you're going to find them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just a, a curiosity thing because when I first became aware, both were available, counted and stamped. Mm-hmm. But but mm-hmm. stamped was was very much a my, minority in terms of what was offered. Yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, so clearly the, there was some kind of a transition to right. that. Um, right. I'm sure. I'm sure that uh, that money played a role in that. With a counted thing, you didn't. You could just buy a piece of cloth. You didn't have to have it mm-hmm. uh, marked up. And then, of course, that production cost dropped dramatically if you don't. If you can put out a design without uh, without having to put out a piece of cloth with it too. But uh, right. Yeah. Well, yeah. and then the evolution of all the different fabrics and the hand dyes and the right. threads and the you know just the explosion of opportunity that we have for what to use. Oh yeah, that's you know that's been the the amazing thing because when well, I mean, I started with needlepoint, and needlepoint was uh, wool, mm-hmm. wool on probably thirteen or fourteen count canvas, and uh, a lot of you know, a lot of a basket weave, and uh, it, you know, it just was not even mentioned. You go into a needlepoint store, and it wasn't other threads were not really that I recall an option. It was well, here's our array of wools, and uh, hmm. now, yeah, exactly, we have so much, and and it's so much fun to see how people intermingle it. Mm-hmm. And uh, there, there really is, you have techniques, but uh, they're not, not clearly defined anymore. You see a, such a mixture anymore of, because of, you're starting to see in cross-stitch, well, we, we see it in, in some samplers, but uh, you're starting to see other stitches. I think more and more people are starting to experiment a little bit. You mm-hmm. know, I can get a different texture. Um, and, and then, Absolutely. Yeah. And then, of course, the threads just <laughs> just never stop. There's just so many options, yeah. just so many options that, you know, we didn't have years ago. And, you know, I remember when there was just one hand-dyed thread company and then another one came in and was like, oh, can we have two at the same time? <laughs> you know, and then more and more. And, then, you know, there's different Etsy shops now crop up that are doing their own dyeing of fabric and or threads. And it's, you know, there's just... It's crazy how many options we have. So, in, in your design work, is that mm-hmm. does is that a positive or is that uh, almost too much these days? Um, no, I think it's a positive. Um, I I will say, as a designer, you I tend to um, be cognizant of what products are available to the shops. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I wouldn't pick an Etsy shop to, for her th- threads to be in a published leaflet. I have used Etsy shop, um, dyers at, when I do a class where I am putting together 30 to, you know, 200, um, class kits. Mm-hmm. To give somebody the to give the stitcher the opportunity to try another thread, to try another fabric, and see you know whether they like this um, person that they might not find in their local needlework shop. But I, you know, it's if you put those kind of people in a chart, and then the the shop owner doesn't have that product in their store and really can't carry all of those people anyway. Right. 
it just puts them in a bad spot. It puts the stitcher in a difficult spot because they're standing in the store and they want, <laughs> you know, what it takes to pull this off, but they don't have it. You know, so it, it just down the line, it doesn't make any sense. So um, I tend to stick with, um, you know, the leading companies that the, sh the shops are stocking for published leaflets. But what's great is, you know, with, with Floss Tube, there's so many people out there talking about their experiment experimenting with you know this color and that color and changing colors and changing fabrics and um doing a portion of the design and not the whole design and it's really opened it up for people to get way more creative than they were years ago about taking one of my designs and and really personalizing it for what works for them if my colors don't work in their house they're going to change it you know so that it, it does work in their house or if they're giving it to someone who doesn't like blue, they'll do it in green or whatever. Um, but it just, it opens it up for people to be way more creative. And then they can use those Etsy folks if they want to, but yet it's not what's printed in the chart. So I think, you know, Floss Tube has, has widened people's perspective on, oh, maybe I can do this, yeah. you know, yeah. which is great. I love seeing that. I love seeing that. Yeah, I, I was thinking about that the other day. Uh, one of the roles of floss tube is I think we're starting to see the I have to stitch it the way it's designed barrier start to crumble. Oh, uh, I, I think more and more people are, are feeling. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, I can. I think it's, okay. it's great. Yeah. I think it's absolutely great. I really do. Um, because, you know, and, and that as a designer, too, was a frustration when people would go in and they would say, I have to have it exactly like this. And if I used some hand dyed threads that maybe weren't consistent over time with their dye lots, then the stitcher who wanted, well, but I want it to look like that. And my Brown that I just bought is not the same as the Brown yeah. you used, yeah. Yeah. you know, and there was, we used to get emails. Well, you didn't use this color because it doesn't look like this. And I just bought it at the store. So you'd have, we had to do the education of folks of it's hand dyed, which means the dye lots are, may not be consistent. So it's going to be a little different. If you don't like that, that's fine, but maybe look at the other colors hanging, you know, on the hooks and see <laughs> if there's one that you like better. Right. So we had to do more of that education that I think people are, are kind of up to speed on now. But it took a while yeah. to, for people to feel comfortable with that um, transition. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. That it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> no, yeah. No, yeah. no one will slap your hands if you change something. Yeah. <laughs> Rest uh, <it's> police. <laughs> yeah, those. Well, and 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 I think that's also a function of the positive online environment. Is that yeah? The the police get squashed, and and the people who are being creative and and constructive criticism and helpful and showing different ways are the ones that have risen to the top. And then mm -hmm. everybody can see, well, yeah, it is okay. I can play mm -hmm. around. I can monkey around with this. And uh, at, at some point it's just a piece of thread. If you don't like it, pitch it. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Right. I, you know, it's giving, it, giving people uh, a new look at their own creativity, which is great. And it's building community within the industry um, of folks that, watch each other every week on, on floss tube or once a month, whenever those floss tubes come out and, and all of the different retreats and events that are cropping up around the country that people who met feel like they know people from floss tube, but they've never met them before right, right. get a chance to meet and get a chance to share the art. And I, and it's a way of building community back into it, a, a sense of community that, that we lost in a lot of places when we lost a lot of our shops yes. back in, back in the, you know, around 2000, 2000, but in the early two thousands, when we lost a lot of shops, a lot of people lost that sense of community that we had when we went to our shops and hung out and took classes and all of that. And now we don't have so many brick and mortars, but people are building that community back in with floss tube and with Instagram and Facebook communities that they've joined and conversations that they're having with stitchers. Um, so we're building that community back up, which is great. Yeah. And yeah. And the, the online gives these retreats 
that you, you can walk into a room and you don't feel like it's a room full of strangers. It, right. it, there's at least a minimal connection because you've at least seen them or heard them on, uh, right. on your, or on maybe your encourage them when you saw their, you know, them publish a finish online and you encouraged them and said it was great, you know, and then when you get a chance to meet them, you know, you're, you become fast friends. So right. it's a yeah. good thing. It's yep. a good thing. When, when did, when did the decision happen to do design work, to, to make it a business? That seems like such a, a leap of faith to me to say, you know, I've got enough of this in the bank that I'm uh, in, in the, you know, in the design bank that mm -hmm. I can make a business out of that. When does that happen? I don't know. For me, it was just, I think it was an evolution. Oh, okay. I mean, I, because I, you know, I mean, I was working and then after we lost my son, it kind of changed my whole mentality of, you know, what I wanted out of life. And I became less career driven and more, I think, family centered but yet wanted a career. Um, and for me, it just, as people encouraged me and I kept doing more design work and as the sales grew, at, you know, with every new chart that I put out there, it just, it evolved for me. And I was fortunate enough that my husband had enough income that I was able to stay home with our girls and um, who we had subsequently and, and you know, work from home. Mm -hmm. So it just, for me, it just, it was an evolution. Um, do you, do you remember the moment you decided I can leave the corporate world and do this? Was that a, was that a, a moment where you just, uh, yep, it's time to do this. Yeah. I, I kind of do remember, you know, that time period. Um, and it being a little scary, but I was just ready to do it. <laughs> I was just ready. You know, you just kind of, okay, it's time. Let's if now or never let's, you know, try and do this, you know, and it's funny. I remember my mother, my dear departed mother saying to me, well, you know, when I said I was going to start this business, she said, maybe you'll make a little pin money. And I was like, what the heck is pin money? I mean, I even had to look it up to find out you know, and a little bit of spending money. I didn't know what she was talking about. And I, I just don't think she had any idea the evolution that the, the business would take. And she certainly, you know, didn't think at that time it would last and continues to, you know, go on. But it was within 10 years that mom was working for me. Mom was putting, um, you know, <laughs> kits together. She was yeah. putting beads and, you know, embellishments in bags. She was helping uh, with, with a lot of threads and, you know, that kind of thing. So it was funny that. <laughs> that it even evolved into, you know, after she retired from nursing and was looking for a little something to do, I put mom to work. Making pin money. <laughs> Making her pin money. Yeah, mom, right. mom, come over and help me make some pin yeah. money. <laughs> but I'll never forget her saying that to me. And I remember thinking at the time, well, I'm not doing this to make pin money. You know, I'm, right. I'm going to make this into something, you know. So, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, and in, in her defense, she's from a culture where, women stayed at home and cooked dinner and uh, well and she yeah. mom was not a stitcher mom mom was a knitter oh so she didn't though, really appreciate okay well she you know it was her mother who taught me to stitch but my mother was a knitter and a beautiful knitter um but i could i never took to knitting i could crochet but i i wasn't i wasn't a knitter but um so she understood and and um supported my um creative mm -hmm. In, interests as a as a kid and and growing up but i'm not sure that she under you know felt like it would grow into you know what it <laughs> what it would, did grow into i'm not sure i knew what it, exactly it would grow into but it did <laughs> yeah I, I suppose it it at some point that's why, why i asked you know do you remember the decision you, you just mm -hmm. gotta grit your teeth and go for it because right. you you and you you believe it's going to work. You've got, uh, like I said, you got a little bank of designs and they've been well received. And you think, Hey, wait a minute, I can do something with this. Right. You know? And, and, and the nice thing was too, I wanted to stay home while my girls were young and it gave me the opportunity to do that. Even when, you know, they were in school, I could work at home and then I'd be here when they got home from school yeah. and I could tailor my hours to their activities and, and that kind of thing. And that, that was, that was a priority. Well, yeah, and of course that's that's a blessing. Anybody who can do that, um, sure. You know, however, you have to work it out. That's uh, such a plus, and 
kids coming home to to uh you know there's mom hi <laughs> so it's, that's a plus yes did did you, the kids get involved the girls get involved in uh in the business or do they stitch the girls do stitch um i i taught them to stitch when they were young our neighborhood we had about eight little girls seven or eight little girls that were all about the same age they would do plays together and and um put together shows and I taught the, all those little girls how to stitch and they would come over and, you know, I had all of the threads and I had all of the fabrics and I had everything <laughs> and all the designs, you know, and I would let them choose. And I, it's funny. I remember one of the little girls in the neighborhood told me that when she grew up, she was going to be a cross stitch designer like me. <laughs> now she's not, <laughs> but I did teach all those girls how to stitch. And, and I don't know that, um, I mean, my daughters have, have picked it back up occasionally, but um, they're very busy with little kids now. But um, but they know how to stitch. And so if they want to go back to it and uh, reap the benefits, then then they do have the knowledge. So but but they helped along the way with, you know, and the, a lot of kidding and button putting buttons in bags and threads and all that kind of stuff. They intermittently helped with that. And, and actually one of my daughters last year, uh, helped me out with, um, she's an event designer and she oh. helped me with the, uh, booth decor for, for market. I, I hired her to help me out because <laughs> I was, uh, I was busy and, and, and backed up and I said, I need event. I need decor. So she helped me out with that. And that was, it was great fun to work with her on that. Hey, that's all right. That's good. Yeah. 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 That's it. That it. You taught all those girls how to stitch and yeah, there's that period in life where I'm sure that that just isn't even in the cards for them. But mm -hmm. I, you know, I always think in those situations, it's always there. Yeah. And when their kids grow up or, uh, you know, they got an idle moment and, and they think, well, you know, what could I do with this? Then, then they, that's always, in the background and can come forward. And I, I just wonder how many people that happens for where they learn early on and then mm -hmm. 20 years go by and then, you know, I really enjoyed that. I'm going to try mm -hmm. that again. Yeah. It's a good skill to have. Uh, it must've been so much fun to have all the neighborhood girls over. <laughs> oh, you bet. Oh, you bet. Yeah. I even took them. Uh, this was when the shop twisted threads was still here in town. We, even did a road trip down there so they could all look at stuff and, you know, experience a cross stitch shop. So it was great fun. They were great kids. And the, we were lucky to have that kind of a neighborhood where the kids all hung out together. Yeah. Oh, what fun. Yeah. yeah that's great. Lots of good memories. <laughs> what, um, uh, what do you have uh, coming up for us? You have new, new designs. I'm sure you're working on stuff all the time. I, Oh, all the time. Um, I'm well, I have the, the square dance series is finished, but it's not all released yet. I'm still oh, working. Yeah, I on... wanted to, I want to, sorry, I'm going to interrupt you. I wanted to no ask problem. you when you do a series like that square dance uh -huh. series where it's one every month, mm -hmm. do, do you, do you, do you design them all up front and stitch the models and have it all ready to go before you do the first one or do some series just kind of happen over time? I have found, I, I know myself well enough now that if I'm going to do a series, I have to have the whole thing done before I show I'm going to do it. Okay. Because if I stick it out there and there's still three more to go, those last three are going to suffer. I don't know. It's something about me. I don't know what it is. I just got to do the whole thing. Uh -huh. So I so I, if I'm doing a, a yearly series, I got to get it done you know, well in advance. Now the square dance series, I, um, I did stitch all of the original models for that, but then I had a wonderful gal stitch, a model stitcher stitch, um, a second model for me. And she stitched them all in a row with a, um, free border design that I give away to go at the bottom that connects the 12. Oh. But I stitched the first ones, um, that are, finished individually as little flat fold standups. Mm -hmm. um, and I find that I have to stitch most of my original models because I'll design something and then, then I design it, then I stitch it and I switch colors too much as I'm going through the process. <laughs> oh, this green doesn't quite work. Oh, these two colors, there's not enough, you know, 
contrast. I've got to change that. And if I just gave it to somebody and said, here, stitch this, um, it probably wouldn't come back in a, in a way that I was happy because of my own work mm-hmm. in choosing colors. There are some times that um, I, in recent years, have been able to do a design with few enough colors and little shading so that I'm able to just give it to somebody and they can stitch the only model of it. Um, but that's hard for me. Um, so, and in a series like that, when you've got 12 months and you're going to run them in a row, you've got to have, uh, enough, um, what's the word that I want? It, it it's got to look good from beginning, beginning to end to all the shading in between. So you have to see the whole thing and know the whole, how the color is going to flow across the seasons, even though you might have pinks in February and browns and golds in October and November. Mm -hmm. So you really have, I really had to work on that one in balancing the colors from beginning to end. And so that one, I, I could not have just done that and sent that off to somebody and been happy with what I, what I had done, yeah. you know, color wise, I just, there's too much changing that I do as I, as I stitch something. Yeah. So, so um, the, des- the design process isn't finished till that model's finished. Yeah, that's true yeah. for me. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yep. So did I answer your question about series? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I got it. I got it. So. No, I, it's just, uh, it's, it's interesting to me that the, the process, the design process and everybody has a little different way to do it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, there are, there are people who can send out a design to a model right. stitcher and right. Yeah. Yeah. And I know a lot of, well, I don't know if it's a lot, but I know there are designers that just, they don't stitch their models at all. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. And, Ooh, I couldn't do that. <laughs> I couldn't do that. I'm getting better at it. Because I don't know if I've been more prolific or if I've been busier or I don't know what in recent years or if I'm just trying to. I've always tried to be a person who knows their strengths and knows and also knows their weaknesses and knows, okay, I can hire somebody to do this. Like I have a photographer who shoots the covers for all of my um, leaflets. I know a lot of people shoot their own photography, but I know. That's not one of my strengths. So I've hired yeah. somebody to do that over the years. I also have a graphic designer friend who does all the layouts on my charts and she has done them since I started. So my look is consistent over 25 years because of my friend, Nancy, who I have known since the first grade, literally she's my friend since the first grade. No kidding. Oh. And she, and she is a trained graphic designer. She has her degree in art and and she's fabulous at it. And I hired her to do my logo in the beginning and she has done my leaflets ever since. And we're good friends, um, away from the business. And she, you know, also does this work with me. And I know that I, my leaflets would not look as good as they do without Nancy. So I, you know, I know that I have hired that piece of it out. Um, and it gives me more time for the design work and the, um, stitching work. If I was doing those pieces, um, and I, a lot of people now are printing their own leaflets at home, get a, you know, buy a really good printer and they print their stuff at home. Not me. I have a printer. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, we, Nancy sends the stuff off to the printer. They print it. It comes back. It's folded. It's ready to go unless I have to, you know, put embellishments inside. So there, you know, I think we all make choices about, where we want to spend our money and where we want to spend our time. And um, those are the the choices that I've chosen to make over the years. Where does the, where does the art part come in? You you have a communications background. So where does the art part come <laughs> yeah. in? Is it I just... don't know. I, I'm a broadcast journalism major, so it didn't come from that. Um, no, there's take... no, there's no, no, there's no art there. <laughs> no, um, didn't. Um, take any art classes. I mean, I don't know. I just, to me, it's just fun playing with color and texture. And I, I I could draw a stick figure, but I can't sit down and draw, you know, Mm -hmm. a pretty picture. I, I I am, I do not have that skill. Um, my husband has that skill 
And sometimes I will say to him, you have to come fix this design for me. I can't get this right. And he'll go, it's whimsical folk art. You don't have to be so worried about it. <laughs> Lighten up. <laughs> <laughs> Chill. But sometimes he'll tweak something just because he sees it. You know, you, ha you have to have a certain eye, I think, to, yeah. to see it. And, you know, it's interesting. I, um, I also have this design line. Um, besides Heart and Hand, I'm a part of the Trilogy design line, which is um, the skills of Bent Creek, Twisted Threads, and Heart and Hand. And we started this design line, I don't remember, 2000, something like that, early 2000s. And um, so we each, each of the designers from these companies do a portion of each of the pieces that we release. And... It's so interesting to me because we each see things so differently. Mm -hmm. We can say, okay, everybody design a turkey and three turkeys come in and boy, are they different. <laughs> Not just in the style, but just in the perspective. Uh -huh. like, like Ruth from Twisted Threads has a, has a more um, dimensional look at things. I'm, I look at things flatter. And it, it's just really interesting to me when we do something like that and the, and the three come in and it's like, wow, you know, we may be similar, but boy, we're different in just how we see stuff. Right, right. <laughs> and it, it's been an interesting lesson in just seeing how other people and see your, things. And your, and your designs evolve based on th those experiences, I'm sure. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh, yeah. design a turkey, everybody. Oh, yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> How did you see that? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I'm like, it, it's funny. And, and I think it's particularly Ruth. She just sees things in a dimensional way that I don't see them to, to draw them. And I, it's just so fun to see what, you know, the different aspects are that come up. It's when we when we first decided we were going to do this company years ago. Uh, we were we were given advice from some industry experts who shall remain nameless, and uh, they said, "Don't do it. You're going to ruin your friendship. Don't do it. I've seen it happen before. People work together in this industry, and it ruins their friendship." And so we had a conversation between the companies, and we said, "Okay, look, our friendships are way more important than this company. If we get to the point." where the friendships start to suffer, we're done. Mm -hmm. We all agreed. And we are still friends to this day. And we still, our, our designing has taken a bit of, we haven't put a lot out recently, just because we've also always said family comes first. And if somebody has, just needs more time for family or for their own company, then they take it, you know, right, and we right. just, we just bend with that. Um, and it's been a great partnership. I've enjoyed you know, working with them, our friendships have, have grown as opposed to suffering. So that's great. You that broke was the one mold. bit of advice we got, which we did not listen to. Yep. You broke the mold. Good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Your kids are grown. What's a day like for you as a designer? Do you, do you, do you have a routine or do you fit, still fit it in? I would say that every day is totally different. And isn't that a good thing? Yes. Um, so because I'm mostly a one woman show, except for these pieces that I've farmed out to other people. I mean, there, it's always different. There's, there might be models to get ready to send the photographer. I've got that to do, you know, today or tomorrow. I write the copy for charts. So I might be writing copy and working with Nancy on the graphic design. Um, I shoot the photos that I put on social media. So for like Facebook and, um, and Instagram, and I get kind of a, a kick out of trying my hand at, at flat lays. <laughs> um, sometimes I'm successful and sometimes I'm not. But um, anyway, so I shoot those. So if it's, so if it's a good sunny day, um, I might go out with my iPhone and, and shoot some, some pictures for social media. And I do the social media posting too, which is um, – it's a time element, you know, it's, it's important to me because I feel like it continues to build community. Right. People that, um, are interested in heart and hand. 
But it does, um, chew, it chews up a lot of time. <laughs> yes, it does. Yes, it does. Um, but I, I feel like it's worthwhile. So I, I do sink time into that. Um, I'm packing orders for the shops. I'm ta- you know, answering emails from shops and I'm doing a lot of that kind of thing. I, there's any of the ordering that has to be done of boxes and fabric and fibers or working on, um, events I might be doing, uh, teaching this summer or, you know, those kind of things. So putting out fires, I think, and you know, it's, it's interesting how your, your life takes turns and, you know, who would have thought when I was majoring in broadcast journalism in, <laughs> in college that, you know, I would be doing this for 25 years, but, but it, I have decided that even though it looks like a windy road, it really was a straight path and, and the work that I did in television actually um, has made my work today easier because when, when I worked in television, um, well, I started out as, you know, writing news and that kind of thing, but then I was a producer. And then when I, when I left the television station, I was the assignment editor, which meant I was in charge of about 50 or 60 reporters and photographers and their daily activities so, you know, Holy Mary and smokes. Joe, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Mary and Joe had to go to the city council meeting and there was a shooting overnight. So said and Fred and Ethel over there. And, you know, so I was responsible for everybody's daily activities and what they had to cover and then getting them all back in time for right. the, the shows <laughs> to be put together. And, you know, if a plane went down or a fire happened, you had to know where everybody was, who was closest, who had the skill set to deal with that issue, reroute everybody, take those stories off of that newscast and put this story and this is your lead and, you know, and moving that around. So the multitasking that that took of managing 50 to 60 people is kind of like what I do now. Mm-hmm. You know, I got 50 or 60 charts in my brain and I'm trying to get buttons and bags and, oh, I got to pack those charts. And, you know, I got to work with Nancy and Skip needs the, the models for the photos and, so all of that educated me in a way that makes what I do now easier. And isn't that an interesting straight line to where I yeah, am today? Yeah. So, well, yeah, exactly. And, and at the time, who knew? And Absolutely. And you Certainly are, not yeah. me. Certainly not <laughs> me. But it really did inform what I'm doing now. Right. Well, yeah, and it, it makes that, that aspect of the business easier. For mm-hmm. you, oh, you bet. Yeah, second nature to you. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Cecilia, yay. That was fun. <laughs> did we already do it? We already did it. That's, uh, <laughs> yep. Time flies. That's fun. Yep. Well, it's a pleasure talking to you, and it's always a pleasure listening to your your podcast because you always have interesting conversations with uh, uh, Frequently, people that uh, that I have never had a conversation with in the industry, and so I I, I learn from your podcast, and I am I'm grateful for that. Well, glad to hear that. I have a lot of fun doing them, and I can't even begin to tell you how much I've learned. So, I bet, <laughs> I bet it's a ton. All right, thanks for doing this. Thanks for making the time. And it's Cecilia Turner, Heart and Hand Needle Art, and we have heartandhand.com. We have on Facebook links on the page. And Instagram, and now we know that when you see those pictures on Facebook and Instagram, that's Cecilia. <laughs> Photographer Cecilia doing that's it. That's right. Well, <laughs> give me some grace, right? Yeah. Yeah. If they're a hair out of focus, you know, don't hold her. You don't, know why. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right, Cecilia, thanks. And thanks to everybody for listening. <laughs>